Many years ago, I met a woman in New Orleans in the United States named Naomi. This was in the aftermath of Katrina, the big hurricane that opened the levees and caused massive flooding. I met Naomi outside of her destroyed home. She was African American in her 60s, physically disabled, using a wheelchair. Naomi wanted to show me her home. It was a small white bungalow structure with steps leading up to the front door. I offered to help her get up the stairs, but she refused, telling me she wanted me to see her in her daily reality. She hoisted herself up out of her wheelchair and proceeded to drag herself with some effort up the front porch and then into the front hallway. It was about 45 degrees in the house and there were bugs swarming around us, so much so that I couldn't take notes for swatting them away. Her floorboards were torn up and I could see down to the foundation of her home. There was no working toilet, in fact, no running water. She was using a dry toilet and then carting away the refuse when she could. It was, in my opinion, hell. After Naomi told me her story, I asked her how she felt living in the richest country in the world in these conditions. Naomi looked at me, and without skipping a beat, she said, abandoned. This sense of abandonment is something I hear repeatedly. The idea that if you're poor and homeless, you don't count. You are invisible. In some instances, not even treated as a human being. I have heard it countless times everywhere I go. I heard it when I interviewed survivors of the Grenfell Tower tragedy. I heard it in Portugal when meeting with people living in the Iliash homes and in informal settlements outside of Lisbon. And I heard it in Roma communities in Serbia. The question is, how did we get here? Naomi's words have long reverberated in my head. Abandoned. Abandoned by whom exactly? Naomi had a community of support. That was obvious to me. She had family members, friends, community workers hauling water in and out of the house, helping her get to her doctor's appointments, helping her find food. No. By abandoned, she meant her government had abandoned her. And she is right. Governments the world over have abandoned their responsibility for housing. Let's remember, worldwide, 100 million people at least are living in the streets, facing daily threats to life and security, and this number is on the rise. 1.6 billion people lack access to an adequate home, living in informal settlements or encampments under the constant threat of being evicted. Many lacking clean water and sanitation requirements of the right to adequate housing. In Europe, homelessness is increasing in every country except Finland. Germany, with the fourth largest GDP, has a homeless population of 420,000 people, excluding refugees. In France, the sixth largest GDP, 480 people die on the streets every year. Italy, the eighth largest GDP, has in excess of 50,000 homeless people. In North America and in Europe, responses to homelessness criminalize and stigmatize people for doing what they need to do to survive. In many places, homelessness is directly related to the unaffordability of housing. In cities across the world, housing costs are skyrocketing and not commensurate with incomes. 
making it impossible for moderate and low-income residents to manage. Professor Manuel Albers has said that 80% of cities in the global north have experienced this phenomenon, where housing costs are escalating at a fast pace and average household incomes are remaining stagnant. And it is always the most vulnerable that are the most affected. Persons with disabilities who are either institutionalized or deinstitutionalized without adequate supports. Migrants who are often considered less deserving of public support as newcomers. Women and youth leaving violent households with nowhere to go. LGBTQ and others facing some of the harshest forms of discrimination, and so on. The most vulnerable people are being pushed out of their homes, neighborhoods, and communities. In my opinion, all of this is testament to Naomi's claim and the claim of so many others that, of government's abandonment. In particular, their abandonment of a commitment to human rights. So again, how did we get here? What are the root causes of the here and now? The root cause, in my opinion, lies in an ideology that was promulgated in the 1980s, that took hold by the end of the 80s, and that became the dominant paradigm in the 1990s throughout the world and continues until today. And that dominant paradigm is neoliberalism. Some may think that I sound like a predictable lefty. But as special rapporteur, I have had the unfortunate opportunity to get up close and personal with neoliberalism. I have seen it in action in Chile, where the housing sector as a whole is based in Milton Friedman's neoliberalism in its purest form. And I have seen it in agreements between the International Monetary Fund and regional banks and many countries. Portugal, Spain, and Greece, for example, that have had austerity measures imposed on them and with those measures, the forced liberalization of the housing sector. Neoliberalism is an ideology that believes in the unregulated market, ironically supported by the state, and that that unregulated ma market will respond to need and that governments should take a big step back from social protections and supports. In the housing sector, it means a number of things, including reducing protections for tenants, such as security of tenure, <coughs> selling off social housing stock, and not producing more, and generally making sure housing is wide open to the unregulated market, which makes Vienna known for its successful resistance of neoliberalism quite unique. In the 1990s and early 2000s, that version of neoliberalism looked pretty bad. But when you add the newer phenomenon of financialization of housing to the mix that we saw in the trailer, well, it creates the impossible housing conditions we are witnessing in cities around the world, including many in Europe. By financialization, I mean where housing is no longer viewed as home and instead is viewed as a commodity, a place to park excess capital, or where it is used as nothing more than a financial instrument to leverage more capital for other investments. Of course, housing has long been financialized. Home ownership through the purchasing of mortgages is a form of financialization that has existed obviously for a long time. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is something new. I'm talking about the unprecedented wealth in the world today that is being parked in housing, used as a profit generator. Sophisticated financial instruments turn housing 
into a very lucrative stock, resulting in huge profits for some and driving up rents and reducing the availability of affordable units for others. Housing is now invaded by financial actors. Banks, pension funds, private equity firms, REITs, shareholders, and rich individuals, all of whom view housing predominantly as a place to park excess capital of which there is an abundance, and to turn a profit and generate more money. Few of whom who view housing as home. And they are buying up properties, particularly in neighborhoods they call undervalued, where affordable units still exist. Properties out of which they know they can squeeze more profits and use as leverage to generate more capital. And beyond all this buying, evicting, and flipping, these financial actors use their political power to lobby governments to develop the legal and taxation infrastructure necessary for new financial instruments related to housing so they can make more money. And they use this same power to lobby to ensure weak tenant protections remain in place. This is the new housing landscape. The impact of this is that people are being pushed out of their homes and communities. Rents are rising, people are being evicted in greater numbers, and sometimes falling into homelessness. Existing stock is deteriorating, new stock is luxury or high-end for investors and not tenants. With no social safety net, People have nowhere to turn. And where are governments in all of this? All of this is happening quite legally through financial structures that governments have helped to create and have failed to regulate. While many governments have abandoned tenants and low-income residents, they have not abandoned investors. But the importance of this relationship with investors and between governments and investors cannot be underestimated. Who are some of the world's biggest investors? Private equity firms. And where do private equity firms get their money? Pension funds, which play an important role in the wealth and stability of a state's economy. European pension funds are some of the biggest in the world. Norway's is the second largest in the world. The Netherlands is the fifth largest. You can be sure that their money, or should I say your money, is landing in residential real estate. What we all need to get our heads around is that housing or residential real estate is now big business. In fact, it's the biggest business of all. It is now valued, residential real estate, at 163 trillion US dollars. That's more than twice, almost three times, the entire world's GDP. Just to give you a sense of what that means, the annual profits of the global tobacco industry, half a trillion dollars. Residential real estate, $163 trillion. Housing as a commodity is integral to economies, to business, and to the financial world. So, this is what we're up against when we say we want to end homelessness and ensure access to adequate, affordable, and safe housing. This isn't about tinkering with programs and policies. We need more. I think it's important to note that the decision of governments to support housing as a commodity or an investment and the complementary decisions to withdraw conceptually and in practice from housing as a social good cannot be regarded as just any old policy decision. As you heard me say in the film, Housing is not gold, 
Gold is a commodity. Housing is not. It's a human right. And it's a human right that governments around the world, including governments across Europe, have committed to. Unfortunately, housing as a place of warmth, security and love, of shared stories and memories has lost its currency. So how do we get back to that notion of housing? I think what's required is a seismic paradigmatic shift. That's why in partnership with UCLG and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, I have launched a new multi-stakeholder global movement called The Shift. This movement understands that deprivations of the right to adequate housing are not just program failures or policy challenges, but are human rights violations of the highest order, depriving those affected of the most basic human rights to dignity, security, and life itself. The shift recognizes that housing can no longer be understood as a commodity, an asset, or a place to grow wealth, but must be embraced as a social good necessary for the well-being of the individual and society alike, akin to how housing is viewed in Vienna, for example. But more than anything, if we are going to solve homelessness and grossly inadequate housing in countries around the world, we need governments to show up, all levels of government. And they need to show up in ways that they have long abandoned, and they need to show up in new ways to counter the very sophisticated and deeply entrenched causes of homelessness and inadequate housing. The shift movement urges governments to adopt comprehensive human rights-based housing strategies. Governments need to adopt a framework that will, will result in structural change, that will prevent homelessness as a priority, and that will address barriers to adequate, affordable housing. The shift views human rights as essential to that framework. If you ask yourself, what is the experience of homelessness or grossly inadequate housing? What is the experience of being evicted or of stereotypes and stigmatization because of housing status? The answer is that all of these are assaults on dignity and life. They all challenge what it means to be human. These are human rights concerns that should trigger human rights responses. Human rights change the way governments interact with people who are homeless and inadequately housed, recognizing them not as beneficiaries of charity, but rather as rights holders, active subjects, empowered to engage and be involved in decisions affecting their lives. A rights-based approach to housing clarifies who is accountable to whom. All levels of government are accountable to people, particularly marginalized and vulnerable populations. Human rights incorporate universal norms which bring coherence and coordination to multiple areas of law and policy through a common purpose and a shared set of values, recognizing the structural causes of housing disadvantage and proposing structural solutions. Earlier this year, I presented a report which outlines 10 principles that all rights-based housing strategies must have, whether adopted at the national or local level. Let me just highlight three. Housing strategies must be based in law and affirm the right to housing as a legal right where remedies are provided for violations of that right. Strategies must ensure rights-based participation and be inclusive of the most vulnerable populations, no matter their place of origin. Strategies must ensure access to justice, and this does not just mean access to courts. 
independent tribunals, commissions, ombud ombudspersons, or advocates can play an important role. While governments need to shift to new rights-based approaches to housing, I think the housing and homelessness sector also needs to shift. I think we have to change within the sector what we think about. We need to recognize that this is a different fight than we have had before. And it's going to require different tools, different strategies. I have to say, I'm not sure the sector is there yet. We have to realize that it's not just about getting more money to flow to services and programs. It, it's not just about having social housing be built. It's not even just about getting the right to housing in legislation, though that does help. It is much bigger and much more foundational and structural than all of that. The shift movement already has a growing number of committed stakeholders. 25 cities from around the world have signed on to the Cities for Housing Declaration, including Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin, Mexico City, Montreal, Paris, Seoul. National human rights institutions are coming on board, as are NGOs and community-based organizations, trade unions, and soon, too, national legislators. So now I am here in Vienna to ask you, all of you, to join us. Because my sense is, if, that we're, if we are going to make change, if we are going to shift and ensure the right to housing for all, we're going to need to come together in a new way, in a multi-stakeholder way, to show the big forces that we are up against, that we understand that stuff is happening, but that we too have strength. We need to come together, sector by sector, taking steps to convey a consistent message. Housing is a human right that will not be sold to the highest bidder. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leilani Paha. Thank you for being with us. And please join me here on the stage because we're looking forward. Uh, we're looking forward to some questions, and uh, I'm happy to now hand over the mic to Leia Ortiz Castel, deputy mayor of Barcelona, and we're happy to get your first question, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Mayor of Vienna to invite Barcelona. I have shared with Leiani many, many times because coming from Barcelona, that it's a city that is far away from Vienna and also in housing policies. We are only 2.5% of, of social housing in Barcelona. I come from a, a city also, we have dozens of evictions every week. In, in our city. And the investors are also uh, buying literally uh, our buildings in the, in the city. We also have the, the pressure of Airbnb and tourist pressure because it's, we have also to, to talk about, about this when we, we, we talk about uh, housing rights. And also, we, I come from a city, a Spanish city, that has been living in austerity policies for, for a long time. So the state is not investing anymore, zero years in, in housing. Also the regional government is not investing. So we are quite alone <laughs> uh, managing with, with this situation. Also very worried about homelessness, no? trying to put also more resources there. So for us, um, 
it's very important that now we, we look that we are not alone. I mean, it's like a, a big consensus in Europe, even worldwide cities, you know, asking for a, a change, for a shift in, in housing policies, and to, and to see that it's not only uh, Barcelona's problem, that even Vienna, with 30% of, of social housing, uh, says that its housing is a priority and something else we have to do. So for, for me, it's, it's now it's, it's to know how to do now. Now we know that we, are, no, we have this priority. Uh, we have a partnership with a very action plan. I think it's, it's, quite, it's quite important, uh, this. And now I think that it's the time for Europe. No? In a month, we will have European elections. We have to put uh, housing in the European agenda. I, I had the opportunity to talk sometimes to the Commission as representan, in, in, uh, representative for Eurocities of Social Affairs Forum. And usually they say housing is not a European competence. No? Normally the answer is, is that. And I said, we have to make this shift and to concrete and to say that housing has to do with the human rights, of course, but it has to do with the economy. The biggest crisis that we have had has to do with debt crisis related directly, at least in the South, with housing speculation movements. It has to do with sustainability, for example. If the people cannot live in the cities but work in the cities, what kind of model we are doing? I mean, in, 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 urban, in urban planning. It has to do with inequalities. I mean, the biggest problem that the that, uh, European Union has now is the increasing of inequalities all around, uh, in, in, all the, in all the countries. And of course, homelessness is there. The data are really, really horrible year after, after year. So we have to say that this European Union business also, no? the, the housing, housing policies. And I think that now we have a long way, no? we have we are making a good job no, to concrete measures. And now I think that the cities uh, basically have to, I don't know, how to, 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 to pressure and to lobby with a big movement of cities at the European level just to put the housing as a priority also in the European agenda, in the European elections, and in the European Parliament. I mean, municipalities, I think it's increasing the presence no, because I think the cities are important to make urban agenda all the goals that 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 we have at global level. So now we need no to use our voice and to and to unit forces just to to press on that we have to change uh, regulations, to change laws, and to change minds. That Leliane said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leia Artis Castelli from the city of Barcelona. Unite the force and to strengthen the direction and empower what you have already worked on, of course, with the power of European cities. Uh, Leilani is ready to take more, one more question, I think. So please just, uh huh. Okay, I have seen two, but light is very strong here. So I'll take the two of them. Okay, please no. introduce yourself if you be so 